Today, I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Kira Rudinski. Kira is the chairperson and CTO of Diagnostic Robotics. She was named one of Forbes 30 under 30 rising stars in enterprise tech. Dr. Rodinski gained international recognition for her work at the Technion and Microsoft Research for developing predictive algorithms that recognize the early warning signs of global events such as disease epidemics and political unrest. Welcome, Kira. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Kira Densky. I'm a visiting professor in machine learning and healthcare at the Technion. And what I've been doing for the last few years is building systems that are capable of taking everything humanity wrote since 1851 till today and build machine learning models that can read all of this information and predict future events, such as pandemics, but also personalized predictions in healthcare. For the last few years, I've been obtaining data around 150 years of news articles, billions of tweets, millions of web searches. Instead of building a system that can read this information, extract causality from it to predict events. How did it work? We would gather information from sentences, like in this example, tanker and merchant ship collide, and apply natural language processing to identify who've done the action, what was the action, on what was performed and with what. The natural language processing systems was trained with different statistical algorithms. We would then build causality identification algorithms. It would actually look for cues that we humans use to convey to each other around causality. For example, one would write that this caused another event, oil spill of Singapore. And then we created a graph of 300 million nodes and billions of edges representing everything humanity knows about causality. We then started working, trying to apply this with different collaboration. For example, here, this was during my work in Microsoft Research with collaboration with the Gates Foundation. We were tasked to predict Ebola outbreaks. Unfortunately, or fortunately, Ebola didn't happen many times in humans, but it did happen many times in animals. And what is very interesting that in all of those cases in animals, they all started from a single event. When humans were looking for diamonds and gold, the system knew that when people were looking for diamonds and gold, deforestation is about to happen. The system knows that when deforestation happens, animals are gonna migrate. But specifically, one type of animal, the bat. And indeed, the latest Ebola outbreak started from a three-year-old child who ate an uncooked bad bush meat, killing more than 2,500 people. But only relying on causality, which humanity already knows about, is not sufficient. We would actually try to identify new phenomena in scientific discoveries. For this, we started combining the information from the causal infrastructure with the correlation infrastructure. For example, when tasked with the prediction of trying to predict cholera outbreaks, the system already knew that storms and floods might cause cholera. The reason for this is that cholera is a waterborne disease. But we all know that not all floods are going to cause cholera. But what is so unique about those floods and storms? We started running the system trying to identify correlations in tax to identify what's unique about those storms. And the system identified that if you have a drought two years before those storms, the probability of them causing cholera is significantly high. It was caused by six cases then 2006 till today of cholera outbreaks in Angola. All of them had this pattern. In Bangladesh, since 1960 till today, 19 significant cases of cholera, 84% of them had this pattern. But this pattern doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. It doesn't happen in Tel Aviv. It doesn't happen in New York. So what is so special about Bangladesh and Angola? You're probably thinking to yourself that there's probably something around the GDP of those countries. And I'm going to ask you, how do you know what is the GDP of those countries? You probably didn't read about this uh, anytime recently, right? 
So this is exactly the concept of word knowledge. There's so much things that we already know that enable us to abstract and understand what's so unique about Bangladesh and Angola, that algorithms that just look at correlation and even causal infrastructures and information coming from word knowledge is not enough. So we gave the system access to hundreds of different data sets. Some of them are structured, some of them are not. The larger one is Wikipedia, all of them coming from the Wikipedia data sets. And let the system think about different types of abstractions, trying to identify which one is statistically significant when concerning about the specific pattern. Is it because of the area total, ethnic groups, population intensity, government type? The system identified that only two parameters actually matter the GDP and the percentage of water. GDP is not surprising. Many of those countries with lower GDP have bad sewage systems. So higher chances of this type of epidemic to actually grow. But what we were surprised is the fact that the system identified that countries that have a low percentage of water have a higher probability of this pattern. And the reason this is surprising is that this is a waterborne disease. So we would actually expect this to happen in countries where they have a higher percentage of water. In April 2011, a system reads a BBC article about a drought in Cuba and start alerting about the possibility of a coal outbreak in two years. We completely ignore this at this time. We're still in the development stage of the algorithm. And frankly, Cuba didn't have any cholera outbreak in the last 130 years. But then a year and a half later, the system picks up another news article from, uh, from the Reuters about tropical storms coming next to Cuba, this time giving a very high probability for cholera. We started talking with different aid organizations in ND a month and a half later, the first cholera outbreak in Cuba in 130 years. Cholera is a disease that kills 100,000 uh, people every year, but it's very simple to treat. If you get clean water in time, mortality rates drop from 50% to less than one. So all of those aid organizations actually needed is an alert not even two years in advance, two to three months was actually enough. So what we use this system is for identifying that something in the weather is actually correlative or causative of cholera outbreaks. So we obtain access to much more granular data coming from sensors of weather from all of the airports since 1970 on an hourly basis. We combine this with information about any cholera outbreak that the World Health Organization had and started building machine learning models that are capable of predicting based on weather data, what's the probability of cholera in those locations in the next two to three months. And we've identified a very interesting pattern that looks at extreme dryness changing to wetness immediately, which is highly indicative with a 94% accuracy before a cholera outbreak. But everything I was telling you right now is around predicting large epidemics and pandemics. And what we started doing in diagnostic robotics is trying to understand how we actually handle something extremely targeted, like the waiting times inside emergency departments. Till 2030, we're gonna have 3.8 billion people without access to primary care. So the three hours we're waiting right now inside the emergency department is gonna be nothing compared to what we're waiting right now. It's gonna be simply eight hours and more like people are waiting today in China. So we've obtained access to billions of medical visits. We'll build a natural language uh, system that can read all of those medical summaries, extracting answers to clinical triage questions. So an automated question answering system and correlating it with the diagnosis that the doctor gave, which test it was given, et cetera. And we started different prospective trials. We ran with 75% of the HMOs in Israel, with five of the largest hospitals, and with prospective trials in Mayo Clinic and Maimonides in the United States as well. The way the system worked is while patients were waiting in triage inside the emergency departments, they've been asked to come to what we call the AI stations ask a set of clinical questions by the system, like a doctor would, predict behind the scene which tests they need, how urgent they are, and start building navigation inside the hospital. We then understood that actually handling patients when inside the emergency department is just too late. 70% of people inside the emergency department could have been handled in primary care. This is saving a lot of stress for the patients and even more than $200 billion for the healthcare system as well. What we started doing is integrating to different entry points in the healthcare primary care systems. While patients were scheduling an appointment, 
a system would interject this flow, ask the sort of clinical questions. Does it hurt when you're urinating? Do you have a lower abdominal pain? Behind the scene, it would actually reach a probability based on our billions of medical visits. 60% of this is UTI. The health system doctors wrote a rule that everything about 30% should do a urine test before meeting with the doctor. So the system would actually navigate them to a urine test, either in a lab or in one of our trials, you would actually be handled a sensor to your home in an SLA of three hours. You do the urine test at home, take a picture. A system would read this from the medical record, update the probability of UTI to 90%, everything around 85% and up, send a red flag to the primary care physician who can approve antibiotics remotely with an additional SLA of three hours till reaching the patient. So we're talking here about the digital interventions and digital infrastructure for digital healthcare. So we were deploying this with lots of the health plans, both in the United States and in Israel and even in Singapore initially. And then COVID happened and we were requested by the Minister of Health in Israel to extend our digital triage system, this time triaging for all of the 8 million patients in Israel, all of the HMOs and all of the hospitals. The way the system works is we would produce for the government a heat map of where COVID is right now, but most importantly predicting how it's gonna spread in the next few days. The way it was used is in the first way, we needed to know where to send COVID tests in time because the belief was this time that it would actually stop different infection chains. How did we do it? Every time a person needed an interaction with the healthcare system or with the government in any way, an additional anonymous questionnaires would be sent to all of the population. People would be asked a set of clinical triage questions. This was the beginning of March. We still knew very little about COVID and some of this we were asking the patients to describe their symptoms in natural language. Behind the scene in three days, we built a machine learning model predicting from the symptoms, what is the probability of the fact that the patient has COVID. If not anonymized, a red flag would be sent to their primary care physician or nurse that would call them and actually help direct them in the healthcare system to either isolations, emergency department, or at home. The way the system worked is either you would get a text message from your primary care, or you just worried, you were trying to contact your doctor. All of them would lead to the same questionnaire. If the system predicts that all is good, you get an all-clear recommendation. If not, a notification is being sent to your doctor and you're being requested to stand still and wait for the phone call. We've also been building models about what's the probability of this patient to deteriorate. The reason we needed this model is patients with high probability of deterioration needed to be sent immediately to the emergency department, while patients with low probability would be kept in what we call COVID hotels or even at home. What it actually helped us is increase the adherence of, of the public to the health guidelines. For the health system, it reduced a lot of the waiting times, but also moving triage to online platforms actually started protecting them and having last departments getting closed because of a single healthcare personnel getting sick. But most important for the governmental agency, it allowed them to identify quarantine decisions, discuss exit strategy and to relief economy. 25% of the population of Israel answered this questionnaire at least once a week. 83 to 89% completion rates. What we would provide for the Minister of Health on a daily basis is for each city, what is the probability that people are gonna report a positive self-report COVID? The numbers in orange, you see, this is what the government knew already. And in green, this is our prediction about how many more symptomatic patients. As you see, this city went into quarantine, this city, Many people reported they've done a private COVID test. The Minister of Health had no information about any COVID test at that point of time. And the system also verified that these people are actually symptomatic. On April 4th, we were allowed once to publish our predictions around which cities have the highest probability of COVID. We published three cities, Migdala Emek, Tiberi, and Ashkelon. The government sent COVID tests, verified our results. And since then, on a daily basis, the Minister of Health has been deciding about where to send the COVID tests based on this type of predictions. We then started trying to identify even causality. Is COVID test is preventing infection rates 
or is it actually just additional numbers that are trying to make us believe that COVID is actually happening? So we've actually done an experiment. This is the story of two cities. In orange, you see the symptomatic load is predicted by the system. The system here started alerting about a high symptomatic load. In blue, you see how many COVID tests were sent. You see the government has sent very little COVID tests. Here on the other hand, in our prediction, they increased the number of COVID tests and it flattened the symptomatic curve as opposed here where it started growing exponentially. So we can actually infer that when, if you send the COVID test in time, it can actually have a high probability of flattening the curve of the number of symptomatic patients. What the system has also allowed us to do is identify new symptoms. At the beginning of March, it was only known that fever and cough are the symptoms of COVID, a symptom identified as the loss of sense of smell and taste after running the system less than three days and immediately deploying this triaging system for the entire population of Israel. So when a person had a loss of sense of smell and taste, our system would predict they have a high probability of COVID. Our system also predicts the combinations of those. So for example, you all know that fever and cough are probably correlative with COVID, but what our system identified that extreme fatigue combined with dry cough is extremely correlative. And this is something that is very little about it. it was published in the literature. So there's still a lot that we can do via machine learning in this pandemic times, but we need also to remember is what's gonna happen after the pandemic. We've been deploying the system and the Minister of Health in Israel, in India, in the state of Rhode Island, where we're giving them proactive medical response, customized protocols, and of course, dashboards trying to tell them when the second wave is coming, where to send a COVID test, and today also for differential isolation. But again, what's gonna happen after COVID? I think digital healthcare is gonna change significantly. And we need to understand is that today there's a shortage of 100,000 physicians in the US alone. So we cannot continue just training more doctors. We need to start automating some of their routine work. And we've seen this in this pandemic times where actually the chronic patients that don't have COVID are the ones to suffer the most. So this is where I think that infrastructure based on machine learning that can help identify differential diagnosis, urgency, which tests to send a patient is acute in the next era after COVID. Thank you very much.